process of creating and maintaining a software application is a cyclical process that we refer to as the Software Development Lifecycle, or SDLC. And the SDLC begins with a need. We have a need for an application or a need for software. Maybe that need is to analyze business data and make projections for business decisions or to maintain a company's inventory. Perhaps we want to present an educational process as an informational application. Or we have a game that we think will be very entertaining to others. Most often it's for a, a client, but sometimes we create software for ourselves. But still there will be a need of why we're creating that software. So let me give you an example. We have a client named Trustworthy Trust Company. They have a need for an app that will calculate from a right triangle the hypotenuse, the area, and the perimeter when the user provides the two right angle sides. Now before we begin creating the software, we've identified the need, but we need to plan our project. And there are several tools that we use in the industry as far as planning our software. One of those is to create an IPO chart. Now you learned in your CS105 or your beginning computer class that computers are made up of components that do input, process, output, as well as storage. In programming, we don't so much worry about the storage. The storage could be an input and it could also be an output, but we do identify the input, process, and output because every program is about input, process, and output to one degree or another. Oftentimes, there are many, many different processes that are taking place based on input and output. In this particular example, though, for our hypotenuse calculator, the input is going to be the lengths of sides A and B, and then we're going to calculate the hypotenuse of side C being the square root of A squared plus B squared. Remember the Pythagorean theorem from your high school geometry days. The area of the triangle is going to be 1 half or 0 0.5 times the length of A times the length of B. And the perimeter is the addition or the sum of the three sides, A, B, and C. Our output that we want to display is the hypotenuse, the area, and the perimeter. Those are the things we want to present to our user. Most software today is graphical in nature, and so we have to worry about creating the user interface, and we use something called a storyboard or wireframe. It goes back to the Hollywood days of sketching out what each scene would look like, but in programming, we'd simply draw a sketch of what this application will look like, and there might be several of them, because it might be multiple pages or multiple screens. I used to do this with paper and pencil, though there's software you can use to do this. Adobe XD, Figma, Balsamic, Sketch are all popular ones. I even use Adobe Photoshop to do some of my storyboards when I'm using paper and pencil. In this particular example here, I used Adobe Photoshop. So here's our form or our window for our application, title bar of triangle calculator. It has some instructions, that's gonna be a label. And then we have a picture in the middle there of a triangle. And then off to the left is a text box named TXT side A. It has a little label called side A above it. And another text box below that, TXT side B, with a label above that saying this is side B. We have a calculate button named BTN calculate. And everything that we use in code, we're going to give names to. So we have TXT side A, TXT side B, BTN calculate. And I use Hungarian notation. So TXT says refers to this as a text box, and BTN says it's the button. And then we have a label here called LBL hypotenuse. So LBL is like Hungarian notation for a label. We're going to use labels for our output. They kind of look like text boxes. In fact, sometimes these are indistinguishable. We can modify the property so a text box looks like a label, and a label looks like a text box. But labels are not something the user can enter into. They are static text, and so they're great for output. Then I have two more labels of LBL area and LBL perimeter to display the area and perimeter values once we calculate those. So that's our storyboard or our wireframe, what this is going to look like. We need to determine the steps of going from the input to the output. What's the process we have to go through? One of the tools we can use to identify those steps is called pseudocode. It's simply writing our steps sequentially in, in English syntax. So my pseudocode is to I need to get sides A and B from the user. I need to calculate the hypotenuse as C equals A squared plus B squared to get the square root of that or take it to a half exponent. It's the same thing. My area is going to be A times B times 0 0.5. Perimeter is A plus B plus C. And then I'm going to display the, si the length of side C, the area, and the perimeter. That's my pseudocode. Another tool I can use to do that is a graphical way called a flowchart. We have different symbols for the various aspects of the process. So I start with a cigar shape at the beginning. 
I use a parallelogram for input or output. In this case, we're getting the input of sides A and B. Then a rectangle symbol is used for process. This is the calculation. We're determining the length of side C as the square root of A squared plus B squared, the area as A times B times 0 0.5, and the perimeter is A plus B plus C. And then another parallelogram for the output in this case, which is display our hypotenuse, our area and perimeter, and then finally another cigar shape that is the end of this procedure. Whether you use flowchart or pseudocode, it's kind of up to you. Flowchart might be a little more older school than pseudocode. I like to use flowcharts. I'm very visual in nature. However, there's another way of doing this, and that's just simply mentally in our head. Now, I do that for simple programs, and I've done this long enough that I can visualize that flowchart in my head without necessarily making it on paper and pencil. But I do still like to use the paper and pencil format for pseudocode and flowchart, especially for longer applications. So having designed our storyboard, and having a, a good idea what this is going to look like visually, we're ready to go into Visual Studio and build our interface. So that's the, the second phase of our software development lifecycle for a GUI application. And so we do that in Visual Studio. And in Visual Studio, we have a collection of controls where we can drag the controls onto our window or our what we call a form and change the properties of those controls to make it appear how we want it to appear, whether it's back colors or four colors, font sizes, the image is being displayed in a picture box. Those are all controlled by properties associated with that particular control. So it's a very graphical nature of creating our GUI interface in Visual Studio for Visual Basic, as well as we can do the same thing for C Sharp. In fact, this particular form, I could, I could use this form for either C Sharp or Visual Basic. The controls would be the same and the properties will all be the same. What's gonna change is the code that makes this thing work. So we can create our application, but we need to write code for our calculate button to take the side A and the side B and figure out the hypotenuse, the area, and the perimeter. So that's the next part of the software development lifecycle. We create our interface and then we code it. If I simply double click on the calculate button, it'll take me into the code editor window where I can write the code. In fact, when I double click, it's going to give me this private sub button one underscore click. It's handling the click of button one. Now, I didn't name my button here. That's, that's my bad. I should have named it BTN calculate. And then this would have said private sub BTN calculate underscore click. And we get an end sub. And then I write the code in between those two, what I call bookends, the private sub and the end sub. This is called a, this is a sub procedure or an event handler. It's handling an event, that click event of the button. And so we take our pseudocode or our flowchart and we convert that into the code of Visual Basic in our case. And we're going to create some variables called A, B, C, area, and perim that will hold a double type that holds a decimal value. We're going to get our input. Remember everything I said is input, process, output. You think of, if you think of programs as input, process, and output, coding will be much easier for you. So we need to get the input. I'm going to get the text from side A and side B put that in my variables a and b. I'm going to calculate c as a squared plus b squared times a half. And just so you know, I actually made an error here. I'm going to talk about debugging. So this little asterisk should have been a caret. This should be an exponentiation instead I did multiplication. Calculate the areas a times b times 0 0.5. The perimeter equals a plus b plus c. And then my output is I'm setting the text property of those three labels to the values of C, area, and prim, converting those to a string with two decimal places. That's what the N2 is. I don't expect any of this code to make sense to you right now. Just within a couple weeks, this will all make perfect sense to you as you learn how to write code for Visual Basic. So we create our code, and then we test it and debug it. We're going to run our application. So I entered sides of 4 and 3 for sides A and B. Click Calculate, and I got 12.5 as my hypotenuse. Now, clearly that is wrong because the hypotenuse can't be more than the two sums together. So there's something very much wrong with that answer. The area is correct of four times three times a half is six. The perimeter is wrong though because the side C is wrong. So I, if I have some test data that I know what should be presented when I click calculate, I can test my application and verify that it's giving the correct results. In this case, it's not. So I've tested it, it's, it's got some errors and I need to fix those errors. And that process of fixing the errors is called debugging. Most often, we're going to go back to our code. There's an error in our code. Sometimes, though, there may be a problem with our interface. Or we recognize as we test it, you know, the interface could look a lot better if I changed it. That's a way of debugging. It still works, but there's, there's a way to improve it. 
And once in a great while, we have to go back to our need. The project just doesn't fill the need accurately. So I go back to my code in this case, and I realize, oh, I put an asterisk here where it should have been a character, shift six. So I fix that, and that's called debugging. And then I test again. And this time when I click calculate, I get the correct answer of 5.00 if my side A is 4 and side B is 3. The area is 6 in the perimeter, 4 plus 3 plus 5 is 12. My program now seems to be displaying the correct result. I want to test this with more data to make sure, especially using some decimal numbers such as maybe 4.5 and 2.75 and see what we get as far as results. This process of testing and debugging and going back and changing our code may take several iterations to do that. Because fixing one error, we may see another error that pops up. Every programmer and every coder deals with errors. Even the most seasoned of us deal with errors and have to fix our code. It's just part of being a coder. It's really important, though, that you test and debug and get your program working. Because if you distribute your application and it doesn't work correctly, you have an unhappy client, you lose business, or if you're working for a company, you end up getting fired if you can't produce software that works. Finally, once we get this working, we're now ready to deploy it, to, to distribute this, maybe just to our user. Maybe we're putting this in the Windows Store for distribution to the world. Maybe we just created it for ourselves and we're putting it on our own computer. But that's the deployment. We're starting to install it and use it. Now, I have an arrow going from deploy back to need. As I said this is a cyclical process because chances are you're going to see maybe down the road opportunities to make it better or to add in new features. And so we come back and we maybe modify the need and the, modify the interface and the code and so forth. Well, no, we buy software. There are new versions of the software that come out. That's the software development lifecycle. Let's take a look now at how that portrays into Visual Studio in our next video. If you just jumped into this video, you can see all the videos from the Programming Practicum playlist by clicking on the image in the lower right. And if you'd like to be alerted to future videos I create, you can click my picture in the top right to subscribe to the channel.